It's a building that straddles two centuries, embracing both the coming modern era and the past where its foundation was firmly set. Once the showplace of a county, today its hallways and rooms now reflect the diversity of the community in which it was born. Hi, I'm Jim Wilhelm. Behind me is the old county courthouse, which is now home to the McLean County Museum of History here in Bloomington. It's the last of four buildings to occupy this site as a county seat, but it's the only one that was born in fire. Just after the Civil War, with the area's economy booming, construction on McLean County's third and most ornate courthouse was completed. Architect Alfred Pinquinard envisioned the new building as being the capital of Illinois' largest county. Interestingly, Pequenard's next project was the Illinois State Capitol Building. Well, anyway, in the basement of the new courthouse, space was allocated for the county's historical museum, which, by the way, is the second oldest in the state behind Chicago. And like Chicago, downtown Bloomington was destroyed by fire. This disaster happened in 1900, and the courthouse was lost. On display are some items found in the rubble, including pieces of melted glass, and this pitcher whose glaze was darkened by the fire's smoke. Originally, it was thought that the new courthouse could be built on the foundation of the old one, so its design is similar to the previous building. In addition, it was decided to recreate the grandeur and antiquity of the last structure. Inside, the public hallways are lined with wainscoting of white marble, and the main floor is decorated with hand-laid mosaic tile. Even the doorknobs add a flourish, sporting the county's initials. In addition, all the bronze throughout the building is artificially aged. Bronze was used instead of wood to keep the combustible level low. Even the roof is made of cement. But in addition to these fireproofing methods, this building differs from its predecessor in another way. It was born in the 20th century. Gas was still used for light, but these fixtures were also wired for electricity. An electric light was not only used for illumination, but also to accent the hallways. Plus, this building came equipped with an elevator, private restrooms, and a centralized time system that ran on water. Each minute, a gallon of water from the dome was released into a pipe. That water forced air through a series of hoses to move the hands of all the clocks in the courthouse. It was a system that was eventually discontinued because of the increasing cost of water. Although ahead of its time, this facility could not keep up with the county's growth. Finally, in 1989, the courthouse and offices moved into a newer facility. Today, the old courthouse has become the home of the McLean County Museum of History. As part of its permanent display, the museum uses its extensive collection to focus on the various cultures that have called this area home. Some of the first Europeans to settle here were upland southerners with a strong tradition of close families and self-sufficiency. But soon, because of the growing railroads, they were inundated by Eastern Yankees and German immigrants. And of course, each of these groups brought with them their own set of beliefs on such matters as drinking. This flask fits perfectly in the coat pocket of a southern gentleman for an occasional nip, which was very acceptable. Germans, as evidenced by this schooner, drank at tables in beer gardens, viewing it as a social event. And the Yankees? Well, they just kind of frowned on alcohol. Their housing was very different. The upland southerners built log cabins, which were easier for big families to build, while easterners built frame homes and their diet was quite varied, as demonstrated by the kitchens on display here. Upland homes mostly cooked in large iron pots over an open hearth, and their diets were heavy in pork and corn. Meanwhile, the Yankees brought stoves, which allowed them to cook a greater variety. And as this churn attests, they used more dairy products in addition to beef and breads. Differences between customs and religions and the conflicts that were created by those variations are explored in these galleries. Across the hall, additional displays depict the political history and the famous court cases that resulted from that melting pot. 
One of the most famous families from here are the Stevensons. In 1874, Adlai Stevenson I became a member of the U.S. House and later was vice president under Grover Cleveland. He was chosen as the southern balance of the ticket. Of course, we all know that his grandson served as governor of Illinois and twice ran unsuccessfully for president of the United States. Anyway, about the time that Adlai I was serving in the House, Georgiana Trotter became a member of the local school board. She was an Irish immigrant who had become a U.S. citizen in order to run for office. In addition, she was the first woman ever elected to public office in Bloomington. All of this at a time when women didn't even have the right to vote. Other items on display include Andrew Jackson's 1833 inaugural address printed on silk, a plate and ribbon from William Harrison's campaign of 1840, and of course there are Lincoln items such as his 1858 handbill, plus ribbons and buttons from his presidential run. There have been a lot of interesting court cases settled on this land. Now keep in mind, this is the fourth building that's occupied this lot. So the cases weren't heard in this room, but on this ground. In the second courthouse, Abraham Lincoln successfully sued the county on behalf of the railroad. Afterwards, he successfully sued the railroad for his record-breaking $5,000 fee. Later in 1872, in the third courthouse, a case was tried that would change the state's school system. It was seven years after the Civil War, and the black population was growing. Nearby, one small town decided to build separate school facilities for two black students. Their parents sued, and the case came before Judge Tipton. Using economics as the basis for his ruling, he stated that additional classrooms were a reckless use of public funds. His decision eventually led to a new state law prohibiting racial discrimination in Illinois schools. In addition to the politics and the people of the area, other galleries such as this one look at the businesses once located here. All of these areas draw heavily on the museum's extensive collection. It's a collection that began in the late 1800s. For example, here's a desk that once belonged to a local businessman by the name of Kersey Fell. He was a friend of Abraham Lincoln's and his office was right next door to the courthouse. Since it was close by, Lincoln often used this desk while in town. And it was at this desk that he was asked to write his autobiography, the purpose of which was to introduce this Midwesterner to the East Coast. Although the public is not allowed back here, we thought it might be fun to browse the shelves just to give you an idea of the diversity of the collection. For example, in the early 1900s, George LeBeau, who was a local music store operator built his daughter a xylophone. At age three, she decided that the xylophone was the instrument for her. Well, George decided that she would quickly lose interest, so instead of buying her one, he decided to build her one. So he determined which food cans produced the right pitch and made this instrument. His daughter became quite proficient, making her first appearance in St. Louis at age six. Eventually, her notoriety landed her a guest spot on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Here's a baseball thrown in the very first World Series by local hero and Boston pitcher Charles Radborn. Still works. Among the artifacts on display is this silver tea set. It belonged to Joseph Pfeiffer, who joined the Union Army in 1861. He was injured at the Battle of Vicksburg and not expected to live, but he did. Nicknamed Private Joe, he became the 19th governor of Illinois in 1888. This tea service was a gift to him from his Springfield staff when he left office. Oh, and despite his wound, he lived until 1938 and passed away at the age of 97. And here's a collection of personal items that belong to Bloomington native Irene Delroy. She was once called the most photographed woman in the world. A Ziegfeld girl, she went on to Broadway and later moved on to Hollywood where she starred in several motion pictures. These things are all part of a large and varied collection which paints a picture of McLean County's past, from the diversity of the people who settled here to a Hollywood movie star. 
and they're all housed in a courthouse which rose from the ashes of a disaster. But the old building is more than just exhibit space. The courtroom plays host to an assortment of guest lecturers throughout the year. Plus there's the Stevenson Ives Library, where over 5,000 people a year come to research county and genealogical history. For more information on the museum, what new exhibits are featured, or for a listing of special events, log on to www.mchistory.org or call 309-827-0428.